See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. Hey, See You Now listeners, Shauna Butler here. March is the month that comes in like a lion, a pretty fitting month to celebrate the history and contributions of women. In 2024, the focus of Women's History Month is on those women who have and continue to advocate for equity, diversity, and inclusion. And See You Now is filled with stories of women who have and are making impact across these dimensions, particularly in pursuit of health equity and diverse, representative, and inclusive workforces. Women like nurse midwife, maternity care pioneer, and MacArthur fellow Ruth Watson Lubick, who opened the first freestanding birth center for low-income families in New York City at a time when women had very little say or influence in their pregnancy care or birthing experience. Shona, I cannot ever adequately emphasize with you the way I did not see the empowerment factor when we went there. I knew that we could make outcomes better. That was never a question in my mind. But this whole idea of empowerment, it it just, it was never in my vision at all. And, uh, but it was put in my vision by a young African-American woman. And this young woman, when she was asked what she thought about the care that was given, she said, you know, if you've given birth, then you've given life. And if you've given life, you can do anything. You can get a job, and you can go to school, and you can do whatever you want as long as you put your mind to it. And she said, I think that's the best thing about the center. It empowers women. And the women in in turn empower their families. And the families can empower their community. Women like Walena Gould, a nurse anesthetist, founder and CEO of the Diversity in Nurse Anesthesia Mentorship Program, whose personal experiences led her to address the lack of diversity and representation in the nurse anesthesia workforce. Changing culture takes time. It's, not, it's, it's something that you're not going to change overnight, right? I think what we need to do first is talk about the historical significance of what really happened and reasons why we're not diversified, because that is what we do not read in the nurse anesthesia programs. We don't read about the segregation back then. We don't read about that the AANA was started in 1931, but it wasn't until 1944 that they finally included members of color. Information like that needs to be out there. It needs to be out there. Let, yeah, let's talk about diversity. Let's, let's do that. Let's, but let's understand our history. And then now let's move forward and talk about equity. And women like nurse entrepreneur, pathmaker, and health activist, Dallas Dukar, founder and CEO of TransHelp, a comprehensive healthcare center that supports and empowers trans and gender diverse individuals and families to secure a healthy, affirming future for all of us. What that reminds me of is a review where someone had said, you know, they didn't even realize that they had experienced discrimination in the medical field until they went here to trans health. And they were treated with utmost respect as a non-binary individual. And to me, that just hits home on so many levels, right? We know that there are rampant levels of discrimination that occur in the medical field. A recent report from the Center for American Progress said that nearly 68% of trans people of color reported discrimination. That's most trans individuals experiencing discrimination in a primary care setting or in any other clinical setting. But when you experience discrimination in a primary care setting, you're much less likely to then go back there or show up for urgent care. You might wait and you might wait till you're in emergency care. And that initial discrimination 
has had a compounding effect where someone's morbidity and possibly the chance of mortality has increased, the healthcare costs have increased, and this isn't just preventing some exacerbation in a health condition, but it's really just affirming people. It's ensuring that people can be known and be able to see yourself reflected in your providers, in the nurses, in the various different staff members. It's not just about the clinical care. Mm -hmm. It's really about feeling like you can be a part of building a home. In this episode, to amplify Women's History Month, we invited the See You Now team to reflect on our past episodes and share those moments of listening that captured their attention, their aha moments of women making, shifting, and shaping history with nursing as their superpower to identify, advocate, and hasten equity, representation, and belonging so all our futures are brighter and our history carries forward these important lessons, roadmaps, and contributions. My name is Jacqueline Bushner. I am a project lead for the CNL podcast. I've been with the show since its inception, and I am very proud of the partnership between Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association. The show that I chose as we celebrate Women's History Month is episode 67, Nurses You Should Know, with the work from nurse innovators Raven Aponte and Joanna Seltzer Uribe. I am in awe and admiration for Joanna and Raven, their tenacity, their desire to uncover and elevate those nurses that have made history but are not known. When you look at the history of nursing, who do we know? Who's our girl? Florence, Florence Nightingale. Nightingale. <laughs> so Lillian, Lillian Wall, Clara Barton. You know, so they're the yeah. first names that come up. I identify as a Black woman. And eventually, you know, I became a Black nurse. I was like, wait, all these things that I learned about in the past about Black nurses and all the care work that they did, it wasn't showing up in nursing. People like me, we were excluded in these spaces and this idea of who is a nurse and what is nursing. So that was the first thing for me and that this idea of nursing and where it started was wrong. Why is it important for anyone to know their history and what gains and benefits do, do they accrue by knowing what their history is, by having that be a part of their identity? There is an adage, what isn't repaired is repeated. I feel like we have lost time, we've lost generations, we've lost decades where as a profession, we could have been walking the walk and we could have been really united and rooting for each other to succeed and being allies for each other. Instead, we've been fighting each other and trying to exclude each other. And I think that has really weakened us overall as a profession. If something isn't working <laughs> in true nurse fashion, you go about fixing it. And what ends up happening is that you end up fixing it for the generations after you as well. So a lot of what we have uncovered as a theme in our, across all of our stories has really been this piece of social innovation, that social innovation as the process of developing and deploying effective solutions to challenge systemic social issues is embedded into who we are as a profession. When we talk about the history of nursing, we tend to think about things in the past, way back when, but that history is still alive today. I didn't know any of this, and I, you know, I am not a nurse, but yeah, who doesn't know Florence Nightingale? But hey, who else has been part of building this profession? Who else has changed the history? So I thought that show and those women are also changing history. They're contributing to society. They're contributing to patient outcomes. And they're building pride among all nurses related to who are these unknown, talented, and 
incredible women that no one knows about. So that that's why I chose them because they are truly changing history. Our objective number one, we see you now and we will always see you, you know, as a, a collective team. We that's our vision. That's our mission is to elevate the voices of nurses and ensure that, you know, they are seen. My name is Olivia Lemberger. I'm the innovation design strategist for the ANA, and I get to be part of the podcasting team for See You Now. One of the things that I just so enjoy about the See You Now podcast is hearing from nurses what a difference it's made. It's solution oriented. And nurses need solutions. Nurses are craving solutions. And so to be continually inspired by nurses and other interprofessional healthcare providers that have been bold enough to try and create that change and succeed, they are role modeling for others what's possible. And that is what is so special about this podcast. I chose episode 97 titled Social Determinants of Employment. And in this episode, Adria Denker, an administrator at Galen School of Nursing, and Emily Fairchild, a student nurse at Galen, are highlighted along with Watisse Gathings. She led a call center for a financial services company in the south side of Chicago. You know, people talk a lot about social determinants of health. I like to talk about social determinants of employment as well. And when you think about things such as, you know, transportation or mental health needs or child care, all of those things can make a difference in someone's ability to grow and sustain a career. So having strategic partnerships where we have an on-site therapist, where there is a on-site nurse practitioner that, you know, all of those things matter to make sure that people aren't just becoming employed, but they could actually sustain a pretty fruitful career by having their wraparound services met. So this episode is one of the shows in our Meeting of the Mind series, which really promotes that cross-collaboration across industries to show how innovative solutions can really diversify, in this case, the workforce and the future of healthcare and communities across the country. That was really powerful, the social determinants of employment. Hearing Emily's voice, you know, the student, incorporating that millennial generation because she had some incredibly insightful perspectives that... I feel will be very beneficial for everyone who listened. So it's very hard to work during nursing school. You either work or you go to class. And if you miss a percentage of class, you're kicked out of the quarter. But if you don't go to work, you don't make money to buy gas. So I have witnessed weekly students get a gas buddy car to help them afford gas to commute. And the food program, I see these works coming into play and they benefit each one of us, every single one of us. I'd totally forgotten about the gas buddy and students who show a need for gas money. Each campus get gas cards to present to students. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Can I add something briefly to Emily's comment about food scarcity? I I can just remember back several years, I noticed that there were a couple of students that during lunchtime, they didn't have any food to eat. So we started this Forgot Your Lunch program, and it was a way to not embarrass people if they needed to get a lunch. And employees would donate, the school donated, uh, students would donate to the Forgot Your Lunch program, and eventually we set up a food bank. I think the empathy around that of how they framed that to be inclusive and not make anyone feel more aware of their potential lack of resources was a really unique approach. And I feel that because the students have benefited from these opportunities of these social determinants of health and employment factors, that they will be able to translate that successfully into their own nursing careers, understanding how important those determinants are when they're caring for individual patients, but then how those determinants affect the health of the community and affect the health of the country. So, you know, I was thinking I would love to receive care in rural Kentucky because these students are going to be exceptional in their ability to really meet the needs of the people they're caring for.
My name is Lois Gould. I'm the innovation lead at the American Nurses Association, and I am a member of the See You Now podcast team. One of my favorite episodes is the Planetary Health Healers, which features public health nurse Casey Belgard and Dr. John Perlin. There's a lot of different pieces of this episode that really spoke to me. Specifically, you know, my mother was a nurse. And Casey talks about meeting people where they are. So sometimes that's in the park. Sometimes it's their home at the school cafeteria. And my mother used to do the same thing. So I'm from a very small town in Western Pennsylvania, right outside of Pittsburgh. And about 50 or 60 years ago, I mean, this is going like way back. There were five families who moved to this part of Pennsylvania and they started like a, a neighborhood. So these five original families, fast forward 40 years, all of the dads had died of cancer. The industry is steel mills and mushroom mines and mining. And so, you know, you have all these dads who have passed away from cancer. And then like three of the five moms of the original families have also passed away from cancer. So we never really gave it any thought until we saw this study about how the rate of cancer in that particular area of the country is like skyrocketed. That just kind of like what made me pick this um, because it was all very relatable. But, you know, I like the fact, you know, that Casey's a public health nurse and just, you know, how passionate she is about climate change and advocacy for um, climate action and social justice for everybody. I started making friends. I started looking for folks that had been looking at this stuff already. Um, and luckily, I found the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments that have really been leaders in making that connection for nurses between health and the environment. And we were experiencing so many wildfires at the time that this was going on. And I was wondering, is anybody else also worried about this. Maybe they didn't see the Lancet countdown report that rocked my world, but there's got to be other folks that are interested in this too. And so I ended up bringing together a small but mighty group of the Nurse Family Partnership nurses in Colorado that were really passionate about climate and health and how it was impacting our families. What do we need to know about maternal child health and climate change? And what are places to start? What are those levers for nursing influence? And it turns out there were a lot. And then when she went to COP27 and wore her nursing scrubs, I mean, that was just spectacular, like absolutely brilliant. I had the opportunity to apply to attend my university, the University of Minnesota's COP27 delegation for the UN uh, climate conference that occurs every year. And I wanted to be there because I wanted to be able to see and tap into these high level climate policy negotiations and, and conversations to see what's happening in these rooms and how are these decisions being made about climate action. So COP stands for Conference of Parties. It refers to the annual United Nations Climate Conference where countries assemble to discuss global coordinated climate action. And it's both a, a gathering and a process. It, it is so many things. It's the UN itself is such a complex system. COP is such a complex process that has many functions where countries come together. Um, but it's not just countries. There are many folks that are represented at COP, folks from business and industry, folks from civil society, folks from academia and, and research, and they're all coming together on this one specific issue. But I found myself more than once standing in the presence of people from all over the world speaking different languages, coming from different perspectives, and just feeling like, wow, how incredible is it that we are all here because of this one specific issue that the planet and the people on the planet are facing? I think that that is really incredible to be a part of. I definitely felt like a little bit of a fish out of water. I think in general, the health community at COP has been small, but is growing. The World Health Organization had their first designated space at COP. 26. So just a year before I was there. And the health community in general, again, small and not a lot of nurses. I definitely got a lot of questions around why? <laughs> How did, how did they know you were a nurse? 
Well, I made the decision before I went to COP that I would wear my scrubs and my stethoscope, which to me felt like first a way to find friends, like I mentioned before, right? Find fellow health professionals um, and like-minded folks that saw the connections between climate and health, but also to provoke those who weren't making those connections to really have a visual statement that our health rises and falls with the decisions that we make on climate. And I think being able to have such a recognizable uniform in a space like that is a visual reminder for folks of when you're in a power position and you're uh, making decisions about climate that I hope you'll think about health in your decision making. You know, that's, I think it's great because like, how could you possibly know about all of this wonderful work that is happening? And how inspirational that it could be, because you just never know what's going to click for you to take that first step to try something new. I mean, there's just, it's just like the breadth and the depth of the work and of the guests that we feature on the See You Now podcast. It's pretty amazing. And I don't really see that you get that elsewhere. My name is Oriana Boret the VP of Nursing Innovation for the American Nurses Association. I am a proud member of the See You Now team. One of the most significant episodes is episode 47, A Vote for Mom's Health, with nurse and congresswoman Lauren Underwood. Representative Underwood is innovating at the policy level in profound ways, and it's facilitated by her nursing expertise and knowledge. She encourages nurses to lead at all levels and run for political office. Her utilization of the nursing process, assess, diagnose, plan, implement, and evaluate, has led to data-driven evidence-based policies that are tackling human rights violations at the U.S.-Mexico border. Very early on in our clinical education, we learn about the nursing process in terms of critical thinking. We do an assessment first. And then an intervention. And then guess what? We take the time to evaluate. Did it work? What do we need to change? And that basic framework is something that is innovative in policy circles. Folks don't take the time to do the assessment, particularly an unbiased assessment. They don't take an opportunity to consult the literature. So to be a data-driven, evidence-based policymaker is something that people just step back and they're like, oh, Like, that's a very different approach to the job. So when I got to Congress, I didn't have an opportunity to serve on a healthcare committee, one that had the primary healthcare jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And so I had to find opportunities to do the work to improve the health and well-being of the American people from the positions that I had. And so I had to be creative. And I was serving on the House Homeland Security Committee, and we were working on U.S.-Mexico border issues. And I was on the border touring one of the detention facilities. And we had jurisdiction over border patrol. And this is during the time when the news was telling us every day how people were being kept in unsanitary, inhumane conditions. And I visited and you're talking to these officers. And if if there was a healthcare provider in the facility, they are charting on like the equivalent of a post-it note. So folks come across the border with medication, with healthcare ailments, chronic conditions. They come across the border with active infections. And there's an assessment done, a clinical assessment. And it's as if that scrap of paper was supposed to keep up with that person as they were being transferred from facility to facility. There was no electronic medical record. They were in and out of hospitals being discharged. No one knew what those discharge instructions were. If they were being prescribed medication, no one knew what medication they were being prescribed, much less the frequency that they were supposed to receive it. It was a complete disaster. And and we knew that children had been dying because of fragmented care that they were receiving under U.S. custody. And to me, that was unacceptable. There is a solution to that. So what did we do? We wrote a bill to put forward some standards in terms of how children were going to be treated and cared for while in U.S. custody and to make sure they have this electronic medical record. Hello, we have the resources. And guess what? We got that signed into law. 
and most importantly, the creation of the Black Maternal Health Caucus, which introduced comprehensive legislation to address the Black maternal health crisis in the United States. When I think about this issue, knowing something's wrong or not quite right, and I'm, we have votes uh, to all of our listeners, and so we have these bells that let us know it's time to vote. But we're just okay. power let- forward. We don't have to stop. We can power forward. <laughs> um, okay, so... So often we're asked to solve problems that don't have solutions or don't have obvious solutions or don't have evidence-based solutions. This is not that kind of a problem. This is a problem that has a solution. It's called the mommy bus and we just need folks to support it. It will make a huge difference. We will absolutely save lives. And that's, it's like my favorite thing to work on. I'm so excited about it. This month, we honor and reflect on the impact of women across history. As a profession, the nursing workforce is largely made up of women. A lot of people may not know about the core nursing document created by ANA, which is the Nursing Social Policy Statement, which articulates the interconnected relationship between nurses, nursing, and our society, and how the care and the practice of nurses, along with nursing's values and ethics, shapes society through the nurse-patient relationship health, and health policy. The nursing social policy statement delves into what society needs from nurses and what nursing needs from society. This includes providing care to all, regardless of their cultural, social, or economic standing. And as services, technology, and economic complexities expand, nurses must increasingly adapt and advance their roles to meet these emerging needs. Hi, this is Michelle Morgan. I work on the Johnson & Johnson nursing team, and I am so proud to be part of the See You Now podcast. One of the episodes that I have loved is the Black Midwives and Mamas Matter. Oh, yeah. The the one with um, Joya Creer-Perry, Monica McLemore, and Jenny Joseph. Um, so, So why did you choose that episode? Because it really highlights the importance of the continuum of care and person-centered care. It brings it to life through such tangible and amazing stories. I also love the fact that it really talks about how there are so many opportunities to change the way healthcare gets delivered to better serve patients. The fact that the system is the system we have today doesn't mean it's the system we should have and that there are opportunities to transform it, improve it, make it better. And it takes vision and the leadership of nurses and others to figure out how best to do that. I need people to then invest in the innovation of Black people, of Black women, of Black folks, because we've been seeing ourselves in the future and we have created systems that go around. But why don't we make that be the actual way that we do work? Because when you do that, everybody rises. When you do that, the white women who have been told that they can only be a nurse and not get to be the supervisor nurse, or you don't get to ever move up or whatever, like all the things that you've been holding on to, too, you get a win too. So this is not, it's not a oppression Olympics, right? Like let's invest in the brilliance of the folks who've been trying to figure this out. That's the core fundamental point that you're making though, that I don't think people understand that if you, if you center the people who are most burdened by something, it improves for everybody. When we think about the theme of this episode in the context of Women's History Month, which is focused on women who are advocating for equity, diversity, and inclusion, I think it's so important because it highlights why centering on those who have the most difficult time accessing safe and equitable health care is so important. I love the idea that by centering on those who are most burdened, we improve health care for everyone. Healthcare has a deep and wide bench of women expertly and effectively advocating for and taking the lead in ensuring diversity, representation, equity, and inclusion. Many of those women in healthcare are nurses, applying nursing science, practice, and innovation, and making important contributions to history, culture, society, and health. And while nurses have been diversity leaders and have made progress in the past few decades building a more representative workforce, we have a lot of room for improvement. 
Nurses from minority backgrounds represent around 20% of the registered nurse workforce, and men in nursing account for around 10%, with the highest representation by men in the nurse anesthetist position at 41%. Way to go, Lena Gould. When we inspire others to understand and value women's inclusion, we forge a better world, a more inclusive world. And when we proactively invest in women, whether by allyship, amplifying women's voices and their work, or showcasing how women make an impact, we can inspire inclusion. As we uplift and explore the vast array of notable women in history and currently making history, we invite you to dive more deeply into the work of nurses to find historical figures, treasures, and inspiration. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening. Nurses are transforming healthcare through innovation, compassion, and leadership. And Johnson & Johnson is proud to continue its 125-year commitment to champion nurses through recognition, skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association is dedicated to building a culture of innovation. Nurses improve the lives of patients and communities through innovative thinking, empathetic connection, scientific rigor, and sheer determination. ANA is proud to support and advocate for our nation's most valuable healthcare resource, our nurses. For more information on See You Now and to listen to any of the earlier episodes in our library, visit seeyounowpodcast.com. Thank you.